Right now, it is my pleasure to introduce Noel Carroll, who is the distinguished, or a distinguished, uh, professor of philosophy at the City University of New York Graduate Center. Woo! <laughs> I stand. Um, so it's probably would be easier for me to tell you what Noel has not been successful at, um, but here's some of the roles in which he has and continues to excel. As an art critic, a journalist, a filmmaker, a screenwriter, dance theorist, a film scholar, and a world-renowned philosopher of art. Um, so to say that he's a prolific writer is like saying Lenny Bruce is kind of important, or like Donald Trump is, you know, a bit much. <laughs> um, he's the author of, I don't know, 20 books, 30 books? He's probably got two more coming. Um, one started probably since he arrived at the conference. Um, <laughs> hundreds of articles, I think. At least, I don't know. It, there's a lot. Um, so I'm going to read you some samples to get a sense of the, the breadth and depth of his work. So a recent book is Humor, A Very Short Introduction. Um, also, Minerva's Night Out, Philosophy, Pop Culture, and Moving Pictures, Living in an Art World, On Criticism, um, Art in Three Dimensions. This is, this is an important one. Comedy Incarnate, uh, Buster Keaton, Physical Humor, and Bodily Coping. It's important because if I'm right, it was your dissertation. So 30 years later, it was a book. So there's hope for some of you, not for me. <laughs> there's no hope for me, but there's hope for some of you. <laughs> um, so engaging the moving Im image, beyond aesthetics, interpreting the moving image, a philosophy of mass art, theorizing the moving image, a philosophy of horror or paradoxes of the heart, mystifying movies, fads, and fallacies in contemporary film theory, several edited volumes, including um, theories of art today, philosophy of film, and philosophy in the twilight zone, and I'm in that one. Um, <laughs> some of his academic articles, I'm, again, some, this is a long list, I've been cutting it down, but um, Architecture and Ethics, Ethics and Comic Amusement, hold on, page two, um, uh, Friendship and Yasmina Reza's Art, Monsters and the Moving Image, Consuming Passion, Sex and the City, problem, The Problem with Movie Stars, Art and Alienation, Feeling Movement, Music and Dance, Vertigo and the Pathologies of Romantic Love, Artistic Truth, The Fear of Fear Itself, The Philosophy of Halloween, um, and now I'm going to mess this up. I, I know the scene and I know, but okay, what Mr. Cree Osot, is that the right way to say it? Cree Osot. knows about laughter. It's the Thin Mint guy? <laughs> no? Is he? Yeah, the Thin Mint. Oh, it's a wafer thin. Yeah. Yeah. Wafer thin. Yeah. Wafer thin. That's Not another wafer thin. <laughs> um, okay. So I've said it before, and I'm going to say it again here. For me, all roads in philosophy lead to Noel Carroll. Um, and I was very lucky to study with him. I, I met him in 95 um, at the University of Wisconsin. And I learned from his encouragement and his model that you can do really good, important, relevant philosophy about anything you want. And that's been really powerful and really valuable to me. And it worked out, which is great. I still, I have a job and I'm tenured. So um, <laughs> many people, many of my, thank you. <laughs> many of my ideas, people were like, don't, what? Don't do that. That's, what are you talking about? You know, but Noel was always like, yeah, that's great. Do it. Um, so except, uh, you know, he, he usually has also written on whatever I think of, which is great, right, for the sources. <laughs> Um, he might not have written on the aesthetics of giving birth from a subjective perspective yet, but I and did I that. I won't. And you won't, he says. Um, so he's often noted as the philosopher who put horror on the philosopher's map. Um, and I have a confession to make here. So first of all, I keep this picture of me and Noel the day after my defense. We met up with my family, and it reminds me to write every time I look at it. Um, so it's really um, precious, and he tells me he has a copy, too. So I don't, I'm sure my picture doesn't remind him to write, but I don't, maybe to have a beer or something. I don't know, um, something. <laughs> but uh, I have to confess, I've never told Noel this, but I, I, I hate horror. I just, I hate it. It's not my thing. Um, now, but you now you tell me. Now I tell you. Um, 
but I, I do love Noel Carroll, so please help me welcome him. Um, and his talk is called Timings. Well, thank you for that wonderful introduction. I don't know whether to be happy or may, maybe a little angry because you set the standard so high. Uh, <laughs> I, I won't be able to reach it. <laughs> uh, I want to also thank Sheila for this great conference. She's been a terrific organizer, as you all know, in, including the amazing feat of planning Don Rickles' death <laughs> during the conference. <laughs> and thank you for that. <laughs> <clears throat> Uh, this is a work in progress, literally. It started progressing last week. <laughs> so it's not as polished as it should be. I apologize, but I'm sure uh, your questions will make it better. Well, it's about time that philosophy's gotten around to celebrating stand-up comedy. Uh, as Hegel said, the owl Minerva spreads her wings at dusk. In my experience, the current flourishing of stand-up seems to take off in the 1980s when comedy clubs uh, really began to proliferate. I was living on Canal Street in New York, and I remember a comedy uh, club opening up around the corner. Uh, at, 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 and at the same time that comedy clubs were becoming very popular in, in New York, stand-up also seemed to be taking over uh, the avant-garde um, although he was always seated, Spalding Gray was, in fact, a stand-up comic. At, at the time, it seemed that uh, comedy, stand-up comedy, seemed to be part of a return of young people uh, to New York and other cities from the suburbs. Uh, their parents, my parents, had abandoned Gotham for greener pastures, uh, but after graduating college, uh, the kids wanted to go back to the big city, and once they were there, they required entertainment of their own. Uh, and that's where the clubs, especially the comedy clubs, fit in. Uh, it seems to me that uh, comedy clubs grew apace with gentrification, and it's continued to do so, supplying, I would hypothesize, an important element in the economic base that keeps the enterprise viable by providing uh, testing grounds for grooming uh, prospective comics. Uh, before I begin uh, the talk proper, I should acknowledge I pretty much assume uh, a version of the incongruity theory of comic amusement throughout. I know many of you are skeptical of that approach and uh, that you will have objections even to the variant I propose. Uh, in defense of my strategy, I should concede that the incongruity uh, theory of comic amusement may not be the last word philosophically that we have on the topic, but I think it may be the best heuristic we have for studying comedy, including stand-up. That is, presented with a joke, a caricature, a parody, Search for the feature that falls under the admittedly commodious label incongruous will help you on your way to isolating the comic levers that moves the audience to laughter. Uh, other factors, of course, will be involved, but looking for the incongruities is always the best start that we have. In my own research, I've found that methodologically proceeding this way uh, with incongruity as an indicator of, of the sources of comic amusement has helped me to identify crucial structures of jokes, uh, single panel cartoons with ca captions, sight gags, caricatures, and even entire comic narratives. So today we'll see how far it gets me uh, to working on stand-up. Now, before I start, if anyone gets offended by any of the humor in this paper, let me say I'm not telling any of these jokes in this talk. I'm quoting them for scientific purposes. <laughs> so don't laugh. <laughs> or just quote laughed. <laughs> because, I've, as I've indicated, the, uh, the talk isn't as smooth as it might be, uh, let me say by way of preview uh, that I intend to explore four dimensions of time or timing in regard to stand-up. Uh, first, uh, the temporal structure of the basic or minimal stand-up routine. Next, its rhythmic structure. Third, uh, it, it's uh, uh, matters of delivery. And, and fourth, timing as topicality. 
Now, I call this essay Timings in order to signal that my exploration of stand-up will be pursued in terms of themes of temporality. Stand-up comedy is obviously temporal, a temporal art. What I'd like to do is try to illuminate some of the various features in which temporality is fundamental to it. First and probably most obviously, stand-up comedy is temporal in that it is typically a monologue of some optional duration with a beginning and an end. Uh, it need not have a middle, except in the mathematical sense of a literal halfway point, where that literal halfway point is of no artistic significance. Many stand-up sets are just a series of starts that conclude, not with the Aristotelian ending or climax, but they just terminate, ideally with a laugh that tops all the preceding laughs, or falling that at least with a big laugh, as we saw in Harry's uh, last night. If there is a better laugh on the horizon after the last laugh, the comic will go for it. Or in other words, a stand-up set will typically not have closure in the technical sense. It just stops, ideally with the biggest laugh of the evening. But in most cases, at least in principle, it could, could at least keep going on. The qualification in most cases acknowledges that some stand-up may have more structure than I just indicated. Some stand-up routines like Lord Buckley's version of Noah Ark, Noah's Ark or various Bob Newhart playlets are narrative and possess a narrative arc with closure. Similarly, some routines have themes like marriage or parenthood which may end with a summary joke. My only point so far is that stand-up routines do not require any greater temporal organization than one joke after another. In this stand-up comedy contrast with other currently popular comic forms, uh, such as sketch comedy, which enacts a story which involves characters in a situation that leads to a comic outcome. <clears throat> not only does sketch comedy have a narrative structure, it has dramatic persona. As Sid Caesar noted, he didn't tell jokes, he played characters. Stand-up comedy in comparison requires neither an overarching narrative nor characters. Some stand-up comics may develop characters, as did Andrew Dice Clay and Bill Dana, who created the Bolivian accented character Jose Jimenez. But characters are not necessary in comedy. Chris Rock is just Chris Rock, or at least Chris Rock the performer. Of course, a standing, com a standing comic may adopt the character in the course of a routine, <clears throat> in the way that Richard Pryor often apes white folks. Or they can even launch into a solo sketch, as Pryor does when he tells how he tried to collect his pay from some mafiosos. But acting the part of a fictional character is not essential to stand up. One can speak in one's own voice, or at least one's own stage voice. Typically, stand-up involves a monologue, although there are examples of famous dialogue themes, uh, like uh, George and Grace and Allen, Abbott and Costello, the Smothers Brothers. Uh, but the basic format of stand-up is the monologue. So far, I have denied the stand-up routine must have a beginning and middle end structure, but it's not altogether without an internal temporal structure or what we might call a rhythm. In order to begin to characterize that rhythm, it's helpful to remember that the earliest stand-up comedy involved comedians just telling jokes to audiences. The rhythm of the routine at its barest was joke, laughter, joke, laughter, and so forth till the end of the set. Some of the introductions to late-night talk shows still use this technique. Nevertheless, much stand-up comedy may no longer simply involve telling jokes. However, understanding the nature of jokes, I think, may shed light on the internal temporal structure of stand-up routines. So let me digress a little to talk about the nature of jokes. Jokes themselves are temporal phenomena. They come in two major genres, 
riddles, and narratives. So-called moron jokes are perfect examples of the riddle of genre. For example, why did the moron stand, uh, stare at the can of frozen orange juice? Because it said concentrate. Or for one with more bite, why is crime so hard to solve in the South? There are no dental records and all the DNA is the same. <laughs> or another, uh, what did Carol Burnett like, like in the pain of childbirth too? She said, take your bottom lip and pull it over your head. Or for a narrative uh, uh, example, Moses and Jesus are sitting on the shores of the Lake uh, Sea of Galilee drinking Jack Daniels and roasting kosher hot dogs over a campfire. By the time the bottle is two-thirds empty, Jesus is feeling very warm and friendly, and he says to Moses, you know, Moses, I think some of your tricks were the best. Moses perks up and says, really, Lord, which ones? Jesus says, you know that one where you changed the stick into the snake? That was the greatest. Well, Lord, we've got a forest right here. Let me get a stick, and I'll give you a private performance. So Moses goes and gets a stick, and standing in front of Christ, throws it on the ground, and it turns into a snake. And no sooner does the snake start to crawl away, and Moses pulls it back by the tail, and it's a stick again. And he does it again and again. So, you know, stick, snake, stick, snake, stick, snake. And Jesus is very, very happy. Then Moses looks at Jesus and says, you know, Lord, I really admired some of your tricks, too. And uh, smiling, Jesus says, which was your favorite? And Moses says, well, walking on the water, obviously. And so the Sea of Galilee is right there, uh, and Jesus is going to uh, 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 take, take a turn. He climbs to a high rock uh, over the deepest part of the Sea of Galilee, and steps out into the water. But instead of walking, he sinks. And he goes you know, down, down three times until Moses rescues him, drags him to the beach, and applies mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation. As he regains breath, Jesus says to Moses, I don't know what happened. This never happened before. Um, never happened in the old days. I just don't understand it. And Moses looks and says, well, Lord, you didn't have those holes in your feet back then. <laughs> okay. Notice these jokes all have a similar structure. There's this... <laughs> As a setup, a punchline, which itself is momentarily pu puzzling, followed ideally by the listener uh, making a kind of sense... Uh, or interpreting the puzzle, or as we say, getting it. A stand-up routine made up of one-off jokes then has a temporal structure, and that is a setup, a punchline, and interpretation, preferably followed by laughter over and over, again and again. Of course, not all stand-up routines are solely made up of jokes, uh, or either riddles or narratives, but they do seem to retain something like this temporal structure of iterated joking. So what features do jokes have that continue to operate in stand-up monologues, including observational monologues, that don't traffic in a succession of uh, jokes? Uh, in order to prove that, uh, probe that, let me look a little bit more closely at what's going on, what's going on in these jokes. In the Moses-Jesus joke, there is a punchline about Jesus having holes in his feet. Why should this be at all relevant? Uh, uh, <clears throat> what, I'm sorry, why this should be at all relevant is that uh, for a moment it's puzzling until the listener realizes that the answer assumes that Jesus' feet are like the hull of a boat with holes in it, such that his body will take in water as the boat might. But this is the wrong conceptual frame to bring to the situation at hand. Indeed, it is an absurd conceptual frame. So the puzzling punchline is comprehended, and I'm saying comprehended in square, in square quotes here, uh, in terms of an almost equally puzzling, in fact, absurd interpretation of whose absurdity we are abundantly aware. <clears throat> 
That is, the punchline or the interpretation of the punchline and the recognition of its absurdity uh, in a manner of speaking dawn on the listener. They dawn on the listener automatic, almost automatically. Similarly, in a moron joke, there is an element of absurdity. Uh, it would be absurd for anyone to make the mistake the moron does. And we know this, but this knowledge is what makes moron jokes funny and not, not tragic. And then the riddle about the difficulty of solving crimes in the South, certain stereotypes about rednecks and their hygiene and mores are via hyperbole stressed absurdly to the breaking point where it is our knowledge of the wild exaggeration that causes levity rather than concern. Of course, the Carol Burnett punchline invites us to imagine a physically impossible uh, uh, situation. So the ab absurdities are all here, broadly speaking, cognitive. They nudge us, as Cass Sunstein would say, to, certain, to entertain what is impossible or at least immensely improbable. However, in other cases, what we're asked to embrace are states of affairs that are otherwise ill-advised, not perhaps because they are improbable, but because they are inappropriate. For example, what do you call it when a bus with 40 lawyer, lawyers explodes into flame? Answer, a, a start. <laughs> uh, or for a narrative example, uh, NASA's planning to send some people to Mars. Uh, they in, they've only got three candidates because they have no way to bring them back. Uh, but they interview these three candidates. The first candidate is an engineer. And I say to him, what, what would it take to get you to go to Mars? And he says, a million dollars. And I said, well, you know, you can't come back. I says, yeah, I still want a million dollars. They say, why? Well, he said, I went to MIT. I had a great education. And I'd like to endow uh, a scholarship uh, for uh, worthy uh, children uh, who would like to become engineers. So they write that down. The second candidate is a doctor, and they ask him the same question, and the doctor says he wants $2 million. He says, why? He says, well, I went to Johns Hopkins, and I had a wonderful time there and got a great education, and I would like to endow a scholarship uh, to uh, some needy children uh, who might want to take up the medical profession. Now you write that down. The third candidate is a lawyer. And I say, what would you like? And he says, $5 million. He says, $5 million? What do you want $5 million for? He says, $2 million for you, $2 million for me. We send the engineer to Mars. <laughs> <laughs> OK, uh, in, in, the, in the first case, uh, the punchline is pun puzzling until the reader, uh, the listener realizes he's being invited to entertain with feigned but delicious malice, lawyer aside. Uh, <clears throat> not an impossible prospect, but surely uh, an immoral one. In the punchline of the narrative joke, uh, the punchline is morally outrageous or incongruous while projecting a hyperbolic uh, degree of mendacity onto, onto lawyers. So, humor can take hold not only when the laws of nature are transgressed, but when social laws uh, and norms and concepts are problematized. And those norms need not only be moral, by the way, uh, but they may be norms of etiquette, semantics, sexuality, fashion, cleanliness, uh, specific institutions, religion, stereotypes of all sorts, and so forth. So humor typically subverts our expectations of how the world is or should be by proffering impossibilities, wild improbabilities, immoralities, transgressions of various social practices, and almost every stereotype conceivable. Uh, in terms of an, a stereotype example, recall Sarah Silverman's, I was licking jelly off my boyfriend's penis when I suddenly thought I've become my mother. <laughs> thereby subverting uh, the stereotype of the mother as sexless and saintly while also upending the cliché, I've become my mother. 
Okay, the label that we can typically use to denominate this vast domain uh, of, uh, of subject matter from absurdity to inappropriateness is incongruity. That is, the realm of humor roughly and only approximately speaking is incongruousness. The punchline of jokes are incongruous or puzzling, which in turn typically lead us somewhat forcibly, again, as casting would, uh, casting Sunstein would say, nudge us to entertain uncritically incongruous, absurd, extremely unlikely, and or inappropriate construals that we recognize are flawed. Uh, a stand-up comedy routine made up of a succession of jokes can also be described abstractly as a succession of incongruities, setups with incongruous utterances that prompt in listeners incongruous construals they realize to be without substance. Moreover, as perhaps obvious, this abstract characterization can be applied to a comic monologue without stand-alone jokes. Describing growing up, the comic may claim in an aside that his father repeatedly told him that he had to walk three hours back and forth to school, uphill both ways. <clears throat> Here, the incongruous aside, I'm sorry. Here, the incongruous aside might be lodged in an ongoing monologue rather than set off as a standalone joke. What's distinctive about stand-up comedy, then, is ideally it will be temporally organized, whether with standalone jokes or not, in terms of a rhythmic structure <clears throat> of initially puzzling utterances that nudge incongruous construals from its listeners, which induce it is to be hoped laughter. Here, the aside may not be verbal, uh, it might be a matter of a gesture, as when Jerry Seinfeld, riffing on men watching other men working, mimes them looking uh, uh, as a dog might respond to a canine whistle, uh, thereby enhancing the incongruousness or the incongruous construal of the male of the species as a creature of involuntary reflexivity when it comes to tools. So gathering these observations together... Um, let me offer very provisionally uh, this, this uh, characterization. The basic stand-up comedy routine is minimally, that I mean, I mean stripped down to its bare essentials, uh, told, a, monolo a comic monologue told in the speaker's actual name, structured essentially at least by a succession of interspersed puzzling utterances or asides that nudge incongruous perceptions or construals from listeners which listeners recognize may not be and generally are not truth-apt assertions. Uh, or, or roughly, if, if something has these features, then uh, most probably it is a stand-up set. Or that's the, the kind of stripped-down version of, of what it would take to be a stand-up performance. This characterization should cover observational character as well as routines involving stand and deliver jokes. In observational humor, puzzling or incongruous asides play the role analogous to punchlines. In fact, if you notice, Harry in the introduction last night referred to them as punchlines. Uh, being technical philosophers, we don't want to make that mistake. We'll, we'll call them puzzling utterances. <laughs> That's the Big advance we've just made. <laughs> so, uh, uh, in in the so the uh, analogous to punchlines in the ongoing discourse, functioning to engender incongruous perceptions or construals from listeners uh, that listeners recognize uh, uh, to be uh, false. Observational humor is a matter of defamiliarizing the ordinary so that listeners can see it afresh. When, John Carl, when Joe, uh, George Carlin asks us whether we have ever observed that everyone on the road who is driving slower than us is an idiot, we recognize that we have endorsed this opinion ourselves while simultaneously recognizing its absurdity. That is, we embrace the incongruous construal at the same time we see through it. Talk of incongruous construals here uh, requires a bit of a detour, too, since not all perceptions of incongruity are conducive uh, to comic amusement. Uh, 
that is to the state the stand-up comic is aiming at. This is the standard objection to incongruity theories. Uh, so uh, certain conditions uh, will have to be added to mere incongruity, and these conditions will have to be met before the type of construal relevant to stand-up comedy can take hold. So what are some of these conditions? Well, in the ordinary run of things, an incongruity, that is a deviation from the way we expect things are or should be, is a cause for apprehension or even fear. If things seem out of order to us, our initial response is to prepare to do something about it. We monitor the situation in case we need to correct it. But this sort of concern would generally tend to block comic amusement. Thus, perceived incongruity relevant to all comic amusement, including stand-up, must be immediately non-threatening or non-anxiety producing. To a large extent, it is the conventions of comic distance that govern stand-up performances, as well as most frequently the demeanor of the comedian, that suggests the situation is not serious and is ostensibly safe, at least for the listeners. Another response that perceived incongruity may elicit with some regularity is the impulse to treat it as a problem to be explained or solved or analyzed. That is, incongruity is often treated as a cognitive uh, challenge, sort of like Will Short on, so on Sunday morning uh, uh, on, on NPR. The incongruity is treated as a cognitive challenge. But in this response, it is also antithetical to comic amusement. The perceived incongruity should not, be pre it should not present itself as a conundrum for cogitation, but as something to be savored for its absurdity or inappropriateness. Of course, the comic context of the stand-up performance conventionally disposes us to treat the comic's incongruities that way. But the material itself typically sustains that response because its palpable silliness strikes us as beyond the pale with respect to negotiating it intellectually. When confronted with an incongruity, a deviation from the way we think things are or should be, we are in the first instance alert emotionally and intellectually to the possible illity that we may need to respond. But when the incongruity is perceived to be comic, we stand down, so to speak. We relax our guard. We feel relieved. From the tension of preparedness, a sense of levity or lightness takes over. So when we speak of the listeners of standing up, of stand-up comedy routines as being nudged to perceive or construe incongruity, the perceptions in question should not be anxiety-producing nor actually intellectually challenging, but be, should be enjoyed for being nonsense, whether in terms of facts or values. Okay, so far I've been discussing my, what might be called the script or the performance plan of stand-up comedy routines. I've suggested that its basic or minimal overall temporal structure is open-ended and that temporally it is internally organized rhythmically in terms of a succession of interspersed puzzling utterances that nudge listeners to engage in incongruous perceptions or construals of the contents of the puzzling utterances. Listeners should not respond to these incongruities with anxiety or intellectual curiosity, but take pleasure in them, in part because whatever tension the onset of the incongruity engenders is dissipated by the apparent harmless nonsense of the perplexing utterance and its implications once interpreted. Or as Kant puts it, laughter is an affectation arising from a sudden transformation of a strained expectation into nothing, where nothing, I conjecture, is the recognition of nonsense. That is, from a state of strained expectation due to the introduction of incongruity, we transition to a state of levity or lightness, the phenomenological feeling that marks our condition as one of comic amusement. 
If the two timings canvas so far, the overall temporality of the routine and its internal rhythmic structure are features of the script of the stand-up performance, our third specimen of comic timing has more to do with the delivery of the script. Admittedly, this is what most people first think of when they hear the phrase comic timing. It's the sense of timing featured in the notorious riddle about uh, the famous Warsaw comic who, when asked the secret of his success, said timing. Or as the joke goes, what is the timing? <laughs> I just quote these. <laughs> Although most of what, takes, <laughs> what it makes for successful comic timing depends on the contents of delivery, the comic's assessment of her audience in that context, one can say the script's contribution, one can say of the script's contribution uh, that unless the comic intends a shaggy dog story, there should not be too much distance between the basic setup and proffering the puzzling utterances for the listeners' minds to play over and savor. And in a related vein, again supposing it is not the shaggy dog effect you are after, the setup to the puzzling utterance should not be so long or so detailed that the audience is likely to lose interest. The puzzling utterance should come close enough that, I'm sorry, the setup and the, and the puzzling utterances should come close enough together that ideally the audience is a near constant set of amusement. In terms of delivery, as the great, greatest Warsaw comic demonstrated, albeit in the breach, a pause is typically required between the setup of the puzzling utterance and its declaration. This Pause is a theatrical convention that alerts the audience to the punchline's imminent arrival. At the same time, it functions pragmatically to give salience uh, to the puzzling utterance, marking it off from the setup and alerting listeners to its incipiency. How long the pause needs to be has to be judged by the comic in the concrete situation of delivery the comic has to assess her audience. She thinks the audience is on the brink, if she thinks the audience is on the brink of coming up with the punchline on their own, she may want to speed up her delivery and shorten the pause. In other situations, she might decide to extend the pause, thereby heightening suspense. But there's obviously a limit to how long the pause should last. Unless the pause itself is part of the gag, as it was in some of Andy Kaufman's routines. An aspect of comic timing uh, that exists, so to speak, halfway between script, by which I don't mean, again, something written down, but uh, a performance plan, which may be written or not, and the delivery of the performance plan, uh, has to do with ordering the puzzling utterances or the punchlines uh, or to speak more colloquially. What I uh, have been examining, or what I have been examining in this regard, might be called spacing. Obviously, some of the punchlines in a routine are going to be stronger than others. So there's a question of how to order them. For example, you obviously do not want all your strongest punchlines in the beginning of a set only to have your routine end with a whimper. Nor do you want them all at the end. The audience may lose influence uh, of interest before they arrive. Rather, you want the strong and the weaker punchlines distributed throughout the performance patently in such a way that the stronger punchlines will support or carry the weaker ones. A clear-cut way to do this, pioneered by silent slapstick filmmakers is to follow a strong gag with a rush of weaker ones so that the mirth from the lead gag carries over and boosts the response to the weaker gags. Of course, it's also possible to lead up to the stronger punchline with a series of, in a manner of speaking, preparatory punchlines, especially if they are on the same subject. 
like the battle of the sexes. However, if one opts for a climactic punchline in this sense, then the comic will probably need a marked pause before transitioning to the next segment or, and or topic of the routine. I posit this kind of spacing as a structure that's located between script and delivery because the arrangements of the punchlines may be pre-planned, but they may also be decided on the fly as the comic sizes up her audience, gauging their taste by taking note of their laughter, sen sensing their preferences for one type of subject or genre of wit, like puns, she may reorder her planned procession of puzzling utterances and asides. The aspect of timing I've been discussing so far, the overall temporal expanse of the routine, its rhythmic structure and its delivery, are all features of what we could call its internal temporal construction. But a stand-up routine also has a relation to the world outside of stand-up. It is the relationship of the comic set to its own times, to what is going on in the culture from which it emerges. Uh, the comic Jeff Jeffries explicitly identifies attention to social change as an element of comic timing. For example, when facelifts were becoming more popular uh, when we were hearing about how all the celebrities uh, were having them and uh, the public at large began to get them, Joan Rivers was able to quip, one more facelift and I'll have a goatee. Nowadays, Botox jokes have uh, more currency. For example, did you hear about the mother who was arrested for having her daughter injected with Botox? The daughter didn't look surprised. Uh, as people come into the public view, they're quickly enlisted as comic subjects. Uh, when I was an adolescent, the Helen Keller story was really in the vogue. Uh, the play and then the movie, The Miracle Worker, were both highly successful. Uh, and so a crop of Helen Keller jokes were on every teenager boy's lips, including, why did Helen Keller go crazy? Because she was trying to read the stucco. Or, how did Helen Keller burn her hand? She was trying to read The Waffle Iron. Neither of these jokes, by the way, are aimed at Helen Keller. Rather, they're meant to deflate the sanctimonious way in which she was treated as a saintly, virtually miraculous achiever against all odds. Um, for a more recent example, Bill Meyer claimed, I believe Dr. Kevorkian is on to something. I think he's great, because suicide is our way of saying to God, you can't fire me, I quit. <laughs> Current events are a natural target for comedy in as much as they invite attention because they represent some change in the course of affairs as usual. Thus, they're right for portrayal as incongruous. As soon as self-driving Uber cars hit the road, they provided a source for comics. As Jimmy Fallon observed, one of the cons to self-driving Uber vehicles is that when a driverless car pulls up to pick up, up a drunken passenger, he starts wondering about how high he really is. Uh, or as Jason Zinneman points out in his recent review of the Netflix special 2017, Louis C.K. starts with a routine about abortion which could not be more topical given the current discussion of a nominee to the Supreme Court. In the CNN <coughs> History of Comedy episode called Rip from the Headlines, Bob Hope is uh, credited uh, with taking topical observations and retailing them incongruously in snappy vaudeville rhythms. Allegedly, Hope hired a staff of writers to track topics in order to produce topical jokes which he would stand and deliver in a sarcastic, know-it-all, raspy voice. As grist for stand-up comics, topical items can be treated benignly, as Jimmy Fallon treats self-driving Uber vehicles, or with venom of higher and higher degrees of octane. 
at present, it seems to me the tendency is for stand-up to be trending towards the more aggressive pole, especially in terms of politics, both partisan politics and cultural politics, as exemplified uh, <coughs> on the right by Dennis Miller and by people like Bill Meyer on the other. In terms of cultural politics, attraction between stand-up comedy and the topical is being registered, among other ways, by the ways in which segments of the population heretofore marginalized are taken to the stage, including various racial and ethnic groups, women, gays, lesbians, and transgendered people. Often they are taking as a resource for their humor the incongruities of their treatment by the dominant culture which stand in contrast to norms of equality. Black stand-up has been a font of leading comics, including such giants as Bill Cosby, Dick Gregory, Richard Pryor, Eddie Murphy, Chris Rock, Wanda Sipes, James Chappelle, and too many more to number. Contemporary women com <coughs> comics, including Sarah Silverman, Chelsea Handler, and Amy Schumer, again among others, have exploited the incongruity have uh, exploited incongruity vis-a-vis -vis the stereotypical image of women <coughs> as the supposedly weaker, more modest, and uh, less sexual gender in order to herald a feminist acknowledgement of female desire. As various ethnic groups have, in a manner of speaking, begun to make it, or perhaps better, to find their footing generationally in the American scene, they've begun to decant their experience in stand-up. Ali Wong, Margaret Cho, Henry Cho present the perspective of descendants of East Asia, Aziz Ansaria of South Asia, George Lopez and Paul Rodriguez of Hispanic Americans, and Ahmed Ahmed and Maysoon Zayed of Muslims. Moreover, the, a lesbian comic, Ellen DeGeneres, is one of the most popular celebrities in America today. And of course, this roster is only the tip of the iceberg. And it suggests that stand-up is doing its part to represent the diversity of America. It is certainly paying attention to important changes in American demography. And in that sense, its timing is perfect. And yet, I can't help but feel that stand-up might be coming too self-satisfied. In that recent uh, special of the history of comedy on CNN that I mentioned, the talking heads, many of them stand-up comics, and the archival routines selected seem dedicated to painting comedy in general and stand-up in particular as essentially progressive. The first installment, fucking funny, portrayed stand-up as a force for the defense of free speech. Steve Allen describes the comedian as a troublemaker where he left no doubt that the trouble was for the betterment of humankind. The second episode, The Funnier Sex, was an emancipation narrative. Um, the comedy of everyday life was dedicated to showing the role of comedy in challenging ridiculous social mores that deserve to be lampooned. A recurring theme uh, was that the role of com comedians sh should be to point out flaws in the society, while the installment uh, entitled Spark of Madness posited comedy, uh, and in this series, most of the comedy that was represented was stand-up, it posited comedy as therapeutic. That is something, and this was explicitly said, that relieves pain, such as depression, and teaches how to relieve pain. Uh, another example of this uh, self-congratulation, I think, was reflected in Jason Zinneman's talk about authenticity, which leads some uh, to suggest uh, that uh, the role of, of, of comedy is socially important uh, because it gets at the truth. Now, much of this may be true, uh, to a certain extent, some of the time. But it is way too rosy a picture of comedy in general and stand-up comedy in particular. Much may be speaking metaphorically on the side of the angels, or if you prefer, on the side of history. 
But we should never forget that it has a dark side as well because comedy is often involved in unsettling our norms, stereotypes, and concepts. It may be tempting to suppose that it is always on the side of liberating us from fixed, obsolete, and repressive ways of thinking and behaving. But incongruity can also be marshaled in support of the status quo by, for example, characterizing the behavior of some outsider as absurd in relation to some cognitive, moral, or hygienic norm. For example, the basic strategy of moron jokes can be enlisted by men in blonde jokes at the expense of women, in racist jokes at the expense of African Americans, Hispanics, Asians, and so forth, uh, not to mention further afield from the USA, in Sikh jokes in India, Irish jokes in Britain, and so on. Humor, including stand-up humor, can be repressive. Think of all those decades of jokes at the expense of housewives uh, that, can, that serve to bolster the prevailing power relationships between men and women uh, uh, w without challenging them. Of course, there is still humor that is neither progressive or reactionary. Freud had a name for some of it. He called it innocent humor. Uh, Fallon's Uber joke, I think, is an example of that. And there is even humor that may serve as a social corrective without being repressive. The Burks on often talked about this. Consequently, as we celebrate contemporary comedy on occasions like this, it is important that we don't overplay our hand. Comedy is not inherently redemptive, nor should stand-up comedians commend themselves for providing a public service, which functions as its justification. There is nothing essentially good or bad about comedy. There is only good, bad, and indifferent stand-up, which is probably already obvious to you aesthetically and should be obvious morally. Thank you. Where'd she go? <laughs> yeah, why don't you, you, you should call, you should call on people. You know how to avoid the ones that are going to be really troubled. Well, it's, it's just a token instrument anyway. Um, I very much enjoyed that. Thank you, Noel. And uh, inconveniently, I didn't disagree with any of it. Um, oh, sure you did. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, I was going to say what you were saying about timing. Uh, in particular, I remember seeing um, a British comedian called Ian Stone uh, shortly after 9-11... Uh, and he did some material about 9-11, and, uh, and I saw him do it several times. And at one show, uh, the audience enjoyed it and laughed, and at another show, uh, they clearly didn't enjoy it, and he said, oh, is it too soon? Mm -hmm. um, and at that show, the thing that he didn't do when the audience enjoyed it was later on, he did some material about the extinction of the dinosaurs, then threw in a deliberately bad pun, the audience groaned, and he said again, oh, is that too soon for you as well? <laughs> Very good. Uh, now, what was interesting is that he had completely changed the content of the material mm -hmm. uh, as a result of what... I mean, he had that planned, mm -hmm. um, but he changed the content of the material in response to the people in the room. Uh, likewise, Hari, yesterday evening, someone took some photos, and he had to refer to that. The question is, is there any other art form that you know of as a philosopher of art that has to be so responsive to people in the room such that the content of the art has to change according to how people respond? Um, since you posed it in terms of degree, uh, I have the worry that any of the analogies that I'll draw uh, 
won't be of sufficient degree. But just to begin, uh, most theater involves making decisions on the basis of the response of the audience. So uh, uh, now I don't know if you count this as a change in context, but uh, you, you may, as an actor, uh, sense that actually this audience really likes things to be camped up. And, and so you might begin to play lines that earlier were being played one way, in a campier way, in order to satisfy that, that audience. Uh, actually, the, uh, Walter Ma Benjamin made a very interesting point about movies and movies act movie acting. He said that, uh, that uh, movie audiences judged uh, movies more critically than they judged theater. And I think what he actually meant by that was uh, because uh, the person up on the screen has no way of noticing how the audience is responding, that they're, they're not modifying their performance. Gregory Peck in To Kill a Mockingbird is not modifying his performance for one audience or the next. And, and since he's not in that way, pandering is too strong a word, but adjusting, uh, uh, the audience is able to actually see his uh, performance or his performance idea more clearly than if you're playing uh, to an audience that, that's alive. So uh, to a certain degree, adjustment is, is going on all of, all of the time uh, in, 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 in terms of, 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 of live theatrical performances. Uh, and, and how... how um, how uh, liberal you can be in changing the context, I think, is going to depend very much on the play and, 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 and the group of players. So uh, it, it, I think there can be that kind of uh, adjustment, um, maybe even in, in some cases, in some comedies, you're, you, you know, it's okay if you add a line here or there. Or if somebody makes a mistake, you make a kind of uh, Im improvised response to it. Now, I, I don't know if you want to uh, say that, that, that that's sufficiently like it in, in degree. But I mean, there, there is a, re a flexibility. In dance, there's that also a kind of flexibility that you have to do when uh, other dancers have forgotten the, the steps or the, the choreographic design is for stage, you know, 15 feet wider. <laughs> I mean, you don't, you don't want to go and, and, and do the pirouette off stage. You've got to actually a adjust the choreography. Uh, very often, a dancer will be unable uh, to perform a certain step or a jump, for example, uh, and, 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 you know, on the fly, an adjustment will have to be made. Um, so I, I think the performing arts in general do involve uh, adjust, uh, adjustments on the fly. Now, uh, whether you want to say there's any uh, as radical, I suppose. We, don't, we have some uh, representatives of improv here. They're going to tell you that uh, if you think improv is different than stand-up uh, sketch improv, that, that, that they're, they're as fast as you guys. <laughs> Uh, so thank you for an interesting talk. Um, I, I, I come to, uh, I guess I'm not an expert in, in the area, and there's a lot of me that wants to be open to the incongruity theory, and, and as I hear more about it in a defense, I kind of open up and, and tend to kind of see the, the reasoning behind it. But there's a gut response that I have to it that's almost visceral, that I think sometimes it's almost, I guess the word is lame. And, and sometimes some of the, the, the humor that it tries to capture I feel like I chuckle at the humor, but it doesn't have this power or force to it that I might find in, in, in some forms of, of stand-up comedy. And when I'm told that Kant also was the one who was a proponent of the incongruity theory, I think, well, yeah, that proves exactly that. Um, but I don't think that you can get that out of Kant. Yeah, but here, here's what, here's what, what I, I just... so, And then I think along with that, toward the end, you were talking about you're kind of trying to downplay a little bit um, some of the significance attached to comedy. And you were talking with Kant that, that the incongruity resolves itself into nonsense or nothingness. And 
part of the humor that I think is really powerful is that, and I think there is at times a truth-telling function that doesn't resolve itself into nothingness, but resolves itself into either a, a destruction of the kind of norm uh, in question or perhaps a critical reflection that's almost philosophical about why we're supposed to uphold that norm. And I'll just give you an example and I'll throw it out and maybe you can convince me of the, comment, the incongruity theory. I, I just think of George Carlin's Seven Dirty Words skit. And, and I wonder, I guess the, the simple way of asking the question is, can we successfully apply the incongruity theory such that it resolves into just kind of nonsense, a kind of relief or a kind of nothingness, or does it so do something that's much deeper? Like, why is it that we have these prohibitions on these words? Should we continue to have these prohibitions on the word? Why do all these words seem to be tied to, like, the body? So what's wrong with the body? What's wrong with sex? And, and things like that. So maybe I'll just throw that out to you. Okay, well, that's, that's very good. Um, uh, several things. The first thing uh, that I would like to point out before dealing with the specific case is is that the 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 the, the theory uh, does not preclude anything you've said because what we're talking about is uh, an initial puzzle uh, that's in, incongruous that usually that will meet one of those 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 things like absurdity and it may do it by way of of for example hyperbole uh, so uh, the the punchline is not literally truth apt. But you can say something that's not literally truth apt that nevertheless points to a truth. When I say that I'm so hungry I could eat a horse, I've used hyperbole to point to something that indicates that I'm very hungry. And so the claim that the incongruity theorists would make is, of course you're absolutely right that uh, Incong uh, that that uh, uh, incongruity theories uh, can be enlisted and recruited to point to different to deeper social truths, as as Jonathan Swift did in a Modest Proposal. But of course, uh, literally, <laughs> what he was proposing was absurd, and uh, that is a kind of stepping stone uh, to uh, pointing to the to the to the deeper truths. Uh, the incongruity theory, by the way, uh, in some sense doesn't claim to remove the observations of the other theories off the board. Uh, it just claims that it's got greater scope. So uh, there certainly is, for example, superiority humor, uh, but uh, not all humor is, is uh, superiority humor. So uh, there, are, there are kind of uh, harmless puns uh, 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 where it's very difficult to imagine who in the world uh, could you be lording it over. You know, what, what, what do you say uh, when uh, you dynamite your kitchen? Uh, Napoleon blown apart, lin linoleum blown apart. <laughs> uh, it's very difficult to uh, establish who's, who's the inferior in, in, in that case. So... The argument between the incongruity theory and the superiority theory, or at least one of them, is that this is more, this has got greater scope. Uh, similarly, uh, you might have noticed I actually tried to actually uh, uh, connect relief theories with, with incongruity theory. So they, they can be put together too. Yeah, and I think you're right. And again, when I say that, it's lame. It's not that it's what I think. It's just something in me that sometimes feels that way. Well, look. I mean, it's true that there are going to be these these nasty jokes, and we haven't. We're not saying, oh, jokes can't be barbed, or uh, uh, you know, it, you can't be uh, uh, out to really tear down some uh, social norms that you think are obsolete uh, or, and deserve to be destroyed. But but uh, incongruity will be part. Though the argument is incongruity will be part of of the mechanism. Okay, we're going to go to the next question. Uh, staying on incongruity for a second, you talked about uh, the incongruity generally having to be uh, amusing and not threatening. Mm 
Mm-hmm. Um, or safe, I'm sorry. It had to be safe, not threatening. And I'm just wondering if that's always true. And uh, I'm sorry, also, and not intellectually challenging. And I'm thinking of Stephen Wright and sometimes Sarah Silverman, and sometimes there's sort of emotionally threatening notions uh, of incongruity like with Louis C.K. So are there some instances where it's not entirely safe, or at least where intellectual stimulation might not be involved? Mm-hmm. Well, that, that's, a, that's a very good question. Um, just to get one part of it out of the way, not intellectually challenging. By that, I mean simply that you don't try and, and figure it. You don't try and figure it out. Uh, you, you don't don't say uh, uh, in response to the the Carol Burnett one. Well, how could you actually get your lip over your head? Uh, I mean, you don't take this as a biological claim. Uh, that's what I meant by it not being in intellectually challenging. It can be uh, intellectually challenging in the way that the incongruity can point to some. Uh, ask you to reflect ab- about some something uh, that that that's deeper. I don't I don't uh, mean that. I mean you just don't approach it the way you might, you know, a chess problem or a mathematical problem or a, 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 a social theory. Um, a, as for the anxiety issue, um, it raises some very deep questions. I mean, if it really becomes personally uh, threatening or anxiety producing to you, uh, I I think it it, it won't be comically amusing. (laughs) There won't be uptake in the comic amusement. Uh, And last night, Harry, and in certain uh, talks I've heard today, people have been talking about, you know, when people get up and walk out. Well, that's, that's because there's a failure in uptake of the sort that the incongruity is pre- predicting is going to happen. I mean, you know, yeah, come on, let's go. This isn't funny. Uh, they they probably were in, well, either it wasn't funny or they've been intellect. If it wasn't funny, they everybody left. <laughs> uh, if it's just, you know, George and Georgette, that's because they were threatened. Okay, we have time for one last question, so. Um, so, um, I have a well, I'm, I'm working on the White House correspondence, so I'm going to ask you a series of questions wrapped up into one, but they're generally about the um, role of intention mm-hmm. and the scope of intention. And so one of, so I'm going to use one example or three examples. Um, <laughs> so um, I teach philosophy and film, right? I was teaching um, uh, uh, Dr. Strangelove, and before Dr. Strangelove, I uh, showed them the short clip of Duck and Cover, and the students found duck and cover absolutely hysterical. Um, and they found, particularly since the day before um, um, uh, Korea had launched, um, uh, <laughs> they found Dr. Strangelove not funny, but actually terrifying. Um, and so, so with respect to now, uh, duck and cover wasn't meant to be funny, right? But now we find it quite funny in part because of the incongruity. You're not going to be able to duck under your desk and survive a nuclear holocaust. <laughs> Um, And then the last uh, sort of role of intention to sort of fit in there is that it looks like um, a counterexample to the theory thus far is Donald Trump's rallies. Because it looks like, um, with respect to the timing of the basic, the script, he has that. It's pretty much all the same. The rhythmic, he has some of that locker up, the call and response. Um, The delivery, um, some things are, are going to be puzzling, but they're kind of reassuring and as far as timing and topicality. So it looks like Donald Trump, so you either have to bite the billet and say Donald Trump actually functioned like a stand-up comic, or you have to sort of limit, or you have to change the scope of the intentions so that you can exclude Donald Trump and and marrying the intentions with respect to some of the script in a way that they're intending, you know, not just to have these features, but also intending to be funny by means of them. Yeah, well, I, I guess I should have made clear uh, not everything that's that's funny is uh, uh, created. There is there is fa- there are found funny things. So you know when you uh, walk down the street and you see you know a stretch Hummer uh, 
parked next to a Morris Minor, that incongruity you might look at it and go, ha, ha, it, it looks weird. Uh, so there is found comedy in the, the world. Uh, uh, some of my teaching, for example, <laughs> uh, counts as found, <laughs> found comedy. Or not, it's not found comedy. That we should call it found humor. But there's a big divide. Uh, uh, just as in terms of aesthetics, there's natural beauty and there's artistic beauty. Uh, there's a parallel when it comes to humor. Uh, uh, not natural, but found humor. The humor of everyday life. Uh, the humor that we uh, may ob observe on the grocery line when we see the National Enquirer headline that says, Grandmother Eats Her Own Head. Uh, <laughs> that, that's found humor uh, versus, uh, versus the, the kind of uh, humor this conference is about, which is intentional. And uh, it, it's also the case, uh, as I can tell you from experience, uh, students don't always laugh at funny things. <laughs> Please join me in thanking Noel for a great talk and discussion.